New Zealand. That small country in the middle of nowhere that you might not know much about besides Lord of the Rings, rugby and sheep. But just because it's somewhat unknown doesn't mean there isn't a long, rich history. So today I'm going to run over it for you as quick as possible. <laughs> Let's barrel through some geography real quick. The vast majority of New Zealanders live on either the North or South Island, though there are 600 tiny islands surrounding, and a few of those are pretty significant. The South Island is dominated by mountains, namely the Southern Alps, and the North Island is mostly flat, where it sits on a volcanic plateau and has great beaches. New Zealand for a long time had barely any mammals besides those that could get there without land. Instead there were flightless birds, and the predator-free land of New Zealand, flightless birds could flourish. You can sort of tell even at a glance why this was one of the last places to be settled by humans. Unfortunately for these birds and their natural tree life, New Zealand's natural isolation wouldn't save it forever. Eventually Polynesian settlers arrived, bringing with them dogs and other mammals. Introduced predators has made life very hard for New Zealand's native birds, and some have gone extinct while others have been driven to the brink. We don't know exactly when these Polynesian settlers made first contact, although the Great Fleet is said to have arrived in 1380, which is when the settling began in earnest. These Polynesians, called Māori, have close ties to Eastern Polynesian people, but they did develop a distinct culture of arts, crafts, mythology and language. They hunted the native birds but also planted their own imported crops, like the sweet potato. Initially settling just the east coast, where the climate was most forgiving, the Māori would eventually spread across New Zealand, forming their own tribes. Contact with Europeans would be made hundreds of years later, when in 1642 the first known European explorer arrived, Abel Tasman. His contact with the Māori was hardly positive. Probably due to some sort of cultural misunderstanding, his expedition was attacked and four of his men killed. This is obviously a bad start to European Māori relations, but don't worry, it gets much worse. <laughs> Europeans wouldn't really return until 1769, when James Cook, a British sailor, made three voyages into the Pacific Ocean and completed the first circumnavigation of New Zealand. Even today, his map of New Zealand isn't half bad. This greatly paved the way for further colonisation. New Zealand became a hotspot for whaling, sealing and trading. The Māori were extremely eager to get their hands on European technology. Partially metal tools and food, but in particular muskets. The importation of muskets would radically shift the balance of power that had been established by the tribal system, quickly launching the musket wars. Suddenly, tribes that didn't have muskets were getting slaughtered by those that did. Metal weaponry is extremely effective against wood and stone. The musket wars lasted four decades and saw up to 30,000 people die, and the entire political landscape of New Zealand reshaped. This, coupled with the diseases introduced by Europeans, saw the Māori population plummet to 40% of what it had been pre-contact. February 6th, 1840 is sort of where New Zealand begins. Māori and Brits came together to sign a document which created New Zealand as a British sovereign state, ruled by a British governor. It's a huge national holiday and generally considered a big deal. It was hardly the beginning of a lasting peace between peoples though, partially because the treaty was interpreted differently by Māori and British, whom had different understandings of how land ownership works, and partially because the Brits didn't do a great job of ruling, and partially because not everyone agreed to it. It wasn't signed by everyone. The treaty was translated by a guy who wasn't even fluent in Māori. In any case, 1840 to 1860 saw a lot of war and conflict. More so than before, in fact. Only a few short years after the treaty's signing, tensions were high as some Māori were enraged at their country being stolen from them. Lots of Māori wanted the protection of the British Crown, but wanted to remain in control of the land. This led to the New Zealand Wars, a series of armed conflicts which, by the 1860s, saw most of the North Island torn apart by war. The result was massive amounts of land confiscation, further reducing Māori land ownership in New Zealand. To this day, there is a lot of tension on the subject of how the Māori were treated, though talks are, of course, peaceful. By 1868, New Zealand was starting to shape up into something somewhat recognisable to the modern day. There was a representative parliament, New Zealand largely governed itself rather than leaning on Australia, and in 30 short years, New Zealand would become the first country to give women the vote. But that doesn't mean the 20th century was short of events or that they were any less important. New Zealand played a large role in the First World War, where we served loyally under Britain. With only 1.1 million people in the entire country, the close to 100,000 troops sent was a huge chunk of the population. New Zealand famously fought bravely at Gallipoli, as well as contributing to the Somme and Passchendaele. New Zealand began a bold trend of punching above its weight on the global stage. In 1951, the ANZUS Pact was struck, guaranteeing New Zealand protection underneath the United States. This defence policy is still in effect today, but there is tension due to New Zealand's nuclear-free stance clashing with the United States 
hey, there might be nuclear weapons on this warship. 1981 saw a huge cultural divide in New Zealand, as people were torn between the proper stance on South Africa's racism as it relates to sport. On one hand, rugby isn't meant to be political, but on the other hand, racism is a serious issue and we can't support it. The Springbok tour would eventually go ahead, but numerous games were shut down due to intense protesting. 1985 saw New Zealand's Rainbow Warrior fall victim to an attack by French intelligence, due to their frustration at New Zealand's relentless and vigilant stance on being nuclear free. Following this event, there was a surge in New Zealand nationalism as people became proud to be New Zealanders. Not always the biggest or the strongest country, but always punching above its weight and always standing up for what is right.